you be? Malachi chapter 4. And so that's where we want to go tonight is Malachi chapter 4. I have a question for you. Do you have a rebel heart? Do you have a rebel heart? Have you determined that you're going to do what you want to do no matter what anybody says? I mean, your family, your boss, your pastor, your friends, even God? Well, in a moment of time, in a moment of anger and hate, in a moment of sadness, King David's son Absalom made a decision to avenge the assault on his sister Tamar. And when he made that decision, Absalom planted a seed in his heart called rebellion. Before we follow the story, I want us to see a principle that God has given to us then we'll see what happens when the seed of rebellion is planted, when it is watered and begins to grow. When this plant of rebellion grows up, may I say it also blows up. And so I ask you again, do you have a rebel heart? Have you planted that seed in your heart? Is it growing? Are you unknowingly planting those same seeds in the hearts of your children or your grandchildren because of a word, an attitude, a decision. And so tonight we see David's rebellious son. Would you please stand with me as I read from Malachi chapter 4? We'll see the principle here in just a moment before we turn to David. Malachi chapter 4 in verses 5 and 6, the last word from God in the Old Testament, and then silence for 400 years. What does he say? Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. May we pray. Father, we, we pray and intercede for our nation. God, how we are, are brokenhearted uh, to know that we are the third largest mission field on the planet. And Father, I pray that as, as we come upon an election, I pray for the candidates on all sides that you would convict them of sin, of righteousness, of judgment, that you would bring them to yourself and that they would be saved and they would begin to make decisions that would be righteous and godly. We pray for revival for our church, revival for our country, and we pray that it would begin in our hearts and in our homes. Take your word and help us tonight to apply it in whatever situation we're in. For those who may have uh, grown children that are away from God, for those who may have a, a parents away from God, brothers and sisters, grandkids, whoever it might be, help us to understand that we are in a place of influence through prayer, through witness, through love, through reconciliation. So God, open our hearts, open our eyes to walk in the Spirit and to be used by you to impact others, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, let's get right in it tonight. There is a problem. The number one problem on earth is this. The heart of man is in rebellion against God. Before we were saved, we were called the children of disobedience, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. All unbelievers are at war with God, Romans 3 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. Why? For all have sinned. And so one man brought sin in the world, but one man is able to defeat sin and to forgive sin. And so the Bible says that every unbeliever is at war with God, but God, God has called for us to be at peace with him. And how can we have peace with God? Only one way, through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
through the blood of Christ shed upon a cross and his resurrection. If you resist Jesus Christ, if you resist his word, the result is war in your soul. If you receive Jesus Christ, if you receive his word, the result is peace. Peace, the peace of God and the peace with God. Now, some Christians are in rebellion against God. You say, well, well I just, you just said that if you're a Christian, you're at peace with God. Well, some Christians, by their practice, are in rebellion against God. Let me give you some examples. Show me a man who does not love his wife, and I'll show you a man who is in rebellion against God. Show me a wife who will not follow her husband's leadership, and I'll show you a wife who is in rebellion against God. Show me a single adult or a win widow who puts their agenda, their desires, their wants, their wishes ahead of the Lord's, and I'll show you a single adult or a widow who is in rebellion against God. Show me a teenager or a child who does not honor and obey their parents, and I'll show you a teenager or a child who is in rebellion against God. What is rebellion? Well, the dictionary says it is, it is resistance against or defiance of any authority or control. It is disobedience. So there's the problem. Rebellion. It's all over the world. Now, here's the principle. Here's the principle. Uh, raising kids is a challenge. Raising good kids is a big challenge. Raising godly kids is an incredible but possible challenge, even in a society like ours that has lost a moral compass. Uh, there are several important ingredients in raising godly children. Parents need to teach children to obey, to obey it, obedience is to be immediate it is to be complete it is to be without question it is to be without complaint we all need to be taught parenting principles we all need reminders and so beginning a week from wednesday room 101 we begin that parenting class now here is some let me give you some very poor parenting advice that i read you have to be tough with your kids Sometimes when they cry, you just have to scold them and then ignore them. How else will they learn how to throw things? <laughs> All right, bad parenting advice. We're not going to follow that. I, I saw a list entitled, Great Truths About Life That Children Have Learned From Experience. So these, these, these kids... They've learned from experience, this wisdom. And this is what we understand from these kids. No matter how hard you try, you can't baptize cats. <laughs> One little girl said, when your mom is mad at your dad, don't let her brush your hair. <laughs> if, if your sister hits you, don't hit her back. They always catch the second person. Never ask your three-year-old brother to hold a tomato. You can't trust dogs to watch your food. Don't sneeze when someone is cutting your hair. Puppies still have bad breath, even after eating a Tic Tac. Never hold a dustbuster, vacuum, and a cat at the same time. One more word of wisdom. You can't hide a piece of broccoli in a glass of milk. Some of you have tried. So the problem is rebellion. What is the answer for rebellion? It's a principle. The principle is here in chapter 4, verse 6. The last word from God in the Old Testament. The last sentence from God for 400 years. Verse 6. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers the key is the heart the key is the relationship and so the key ingredient is to grow a loving heart relationship with god with family with friends what's the heart proverbs 23 26 my son give me thine heart god desires the hearts of parents and children and grandchildren and grandparents to be closely knit together now, there's a prophecy. Look at the end of the verse. It ends with a warning, a warning of what happens if fathers don't turn their hearts to their children. 
and children don't turn their hearts to their parents. It says, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Are, are we seeing that happen in our country? Are we seeing the fulfillment of that happening? Kids shooting kids on our streets. Public schools have to have armed guards. They have to have metal detectors. We have baby daycares in our high schools. We live in a time when many are afraid to walk the city streets alone, or they're afraid to walk the city streets even if they're not alone. So you have the heart, you have the prophecy, now you have the fulfillment. So turn over to Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, and here we find a man by the name of Zacharias. He's an elderly man. The man who will become the father of John the Baptist. It is his turn to serve in the temple. Now, now understand that, that there are so many priests that they would have to take turns, and their turn might only come up once in a lifetime to serve as a priest in the temple in the holy place. What a privilege. What an honor to be able to go and to go into the holy place next to the holy of holies, to go in and burn incense, which represented their prayers to God, uh, the showbread, and take care of the candle opera. It's Zachariah's turn. What an honor. What a privilege. He is in the holy place praying for Israel, praying for Messiah. Luke chapter 1, and we pick it up here in verse 8. Luke 1, 8. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest office before God in the order of his course, in his turn, according to the custom of the priest office, his law was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without, outside, at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. Now, do you understand that he should be in the holy place alone? He should be in there all by himself, and then there's a man standing there, a man who is shining brightly. Well, according to verse 19, it's Gabriel. It's Gabriel, the angel. And he's been sent by God to give an announcement. What is the announcement? We find it here in verse 13. In verse 13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him. Now, watch, watch, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, look at verse 17 there. Uh, you, 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 re, you recall the prophecy of Malachi 4 6. Turn the hearts of the, the, the fathers to the children. But notice now, turn the disobedient, that's the children, to the wisdom of the just, that's supposed to be the parents. And so the number one characteristic of wisdom is justice. Justice. When children see their parents as just rather than unjust, then children are more likely to cease their disobedience, cease their rebellion, and give their hearts to their parents. Now the verse ends, to make a people prepared for the Lord. Young people are not prepared for God to work in their lives until their hearts are turned from themselves and turned from others and turned to their parents. There's the truth. There's the truth. Now, we're, now we'll turn to the passage where the truth is illustrated in David's family. So let's turn now to 2 Samuel chapter 13, and we'll pick up the account where we left off. David had prayed for his baby that 
died. He married Bathsheba. He had another son named Solomon. So let, let's pick up the account here. 2 Samuel chapter 13. And so in the aftermath of the guilt and the grief and what's happening at home now, chapter 13, verse 1. And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. That means she was very beautiful. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend, his cousin, whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea. David's brother, and Jonadab was a very subtle man. And he said unto him, Why art thou, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. That would be his half-sister. And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed, and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, saying to him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come and give me meat and dress the meat in my sight that I may see it and eat at her hand. And Amnon lay down and made himself sick. And when the king was come to see him, Amnon said unto the king, I pray thee, let Tamar, my sister, come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat at her hand. David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go now to thy brother's, brother Amnon's house and dress him meat. 2 Samuel chapter 13 and 14 tells how King David lost the heart of his son Absalom. Absalom and Tamar, same mom, same dad, they are full-blooded brother and sister. David was not as protected of Tamar as he should have been. David allowed Tamar's half-brother, different mother, to be alone with Tamar. Amnon forced himself upon his half-sister, and he assaulted her. Amnon's love is not love at all. It is lust. And we see that in verse 15. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise, be gone. You know, there's, there's been a teen campaign for a number of years in our country called True Love Waits. True Love Waits. Teaching teens and singles purity. May I say that the opposite is true? Fake love doesn't wait. Fake love doesn't wait. The immorality the pornography, the prostitution, uh, the worldly songs of rock and country, the sexual movie, movies, that's not about love. They can say it's about love, but it's about lust. The world cries out, that's not a sin, that's not rebellion, but it is. Sexual sin is rebellion against God. And so you have the assault by Amnon. Then you have the reaction by David. David was angry when he heard what happened, but he took no action. Look with me in verse 21. But when David, when King David heard all these things that Amnon had assaulted Tamar, he was very wroth. He is very mad. He is extremely upset. He is angry. He is angry, but no action. So David violated the principle of Malachi chapter 4. David provided for the physical care of his family. But he did not provide for the spiritual direction. His wives and his children, they live in this fabulous, fabulous palace. Uh, money uh, cannot buy the best things in life. And he had the money, but he didn't have the best things. You see, relationship, relationship is key. And so now you go to the rebellion of Absalom, verse 22. And Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad... For Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. And so rebellion began with a seed planted that day, a seed of hate. What did Gabriel say about John the Baptist? He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. 
Then he shall turn the disobedient to the just. You see, when, when parents are perceived as being just, you avoid rebellion. When parents are perceived as not being just, you create rebellion. Two years later, two years past, Absalom had his half-brother Amnon executed to revenge his sister's assault. We see in verse 28. Verse 28. Now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark ye now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, when I say unto you, Smite Amnon, then kill him, fear not. Have not I commanded you? Be courageous, be valiant. And the servants of Absalom did unto Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons rose up, every man got him up upon his mule, and they fled. Absalom kills his brother. And this begins the rift between David and Absalom. Verse 34, Absalom fled. Absalom fled to Geshur for three years. Down to verse 37. Verse 37. But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amihud, king of Geshur. And David mounted for mourned for his son every day. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur and was there three years. And the soul of King David longed to go forth unto Absalom. You know where he went? He went to be with his grandfather. His grandfather lived in Geshur. His grandfather was king of Geshur. Granddad enabled Absalom to prepare a plot to overthrow his dad's kingdom. Granddad enabled Absalom in his rebellion. Yeah, it's not a good thing for grandparents to do. Uh, grandparents need to support mom and dad and to support God's plan. So let's compare now the heart of the father and the heart of the son. The heart of the father, David's heart. He longs to be reconciled with his son. And we see that. The soul of King David longed to go forth to Absalom, verse 39. But he's mad at him. Absalom committed murder. Absalom took it upon himself to be judge, jury, and executioner. He took the law into his own hands. It was evil. It was wrong. David was the king. And so he let Absalom stay in exile for three years. You know, like the father in the parable of the prodigal son. David longed for the day he would come home. He prayed for the day that he would come home. He prayed for it, and finally one day it happened. So we see David's heart. Now we see the heart of the son, Absalom's heart. So Joab works a plan to get Absalom to come home here in chapter 14. Has a lady come in, tell a story, and that story ends up being a parable. And so chapter 14, verse 21, And the king said to Joab, Behold now, I have done this thing. Go therefore, bring the young man Absalom home again. But when Joab went to get Absalom, look what happened next. Verse 23 and 24. So Joab arose and went to Geshur, brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the king said, Let him turn to his own house. Let him not see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house and saw not the king's face. And so now two years pass, two more years, David refuses to talk to his son. Absalom was provoked to wrath by his father's five-year silence, three years in in, uh, in Geshur, two years at home, unable to see his dad. Abs Absalom is, is now very upset. He, he calls for Joab and, to come and help. When Joab did not come, you know what he did? He set his fields on fire. The barley fields are on fire. And those fields on fire are a picture of Absalom's heart burning with anger, rejection, distress, because of being cut off from his father. So finally, Joab came, and Absalom looked at him, and, and this is what he says, verse 32, chapter 14, verse 32. And Absalom answered Joab, Behold, I sent unto thee, saying, Come hither, that I may send thee to the king, to say, Wherefore am I come from Jes uh, Geshur? 
It had been good for me to have been there still. Now, therefore, let me see the king's face. And if there be any iniquity in me, let him kill me. You see, Absalom believed he was just. Dad didn't take the matters into his own hands, so I took the matter into my own hands. I did the right thing, taking out Amnon. You see, this grown man had everything but one thing. I want you to look to see what he had. He is popular. He is popular among the people. Verse 25. But in all Israel, there was none to be so much more praised as Absalom. He is popular among the people. He is also, he has beauty. He is handsome. Uh, none as to be praised for his beauty. He's a handsome dude. Uh, he is voted most likely to succeed. I mean, he looks perfect. The end of verse 25. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. Uh, he didn't need any beauty products. He didn't need any medication for acne. Uh, I mean, he is a good-looking guy. Notice verse 26. And when he pulled, when he cut his, his hair off his head, it was every year, at the end of every year, he pulled it, he cut it, because the hair was heavy on him. Therefore, he cut it. He weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels after the king's weight. They estimate that his hair weighed three and a half to four pounds. That's a lot of hair. That's a thick head of hair. He'd be in the cover of the magazines today, wouldn't he? One more thing, his family, verse 27. And unto Absalom there were born three sons and one daughter, whose name was Tamar. He named his daughter after his sister. And she was a woman of fair countenance. So what does this guy have? He's got popularity. He's handsome. He's voted most likely to succeed. Uh, he has an ideal family situation. But he's missing something. His father's approval. Verse 28. So Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem, and he saw not the king's face. Are you looking for your father's approval? Some of you are grown, and you don't have your father's approval. Maybe he died when you were young. Maybe he died as you were an adult. Maybe you had a strained relationship. Maybe he was always absent. He was absent because of work. He was absent because of hobbies. He was absent because he was selfish. Maybe he divorced your mother uh, and he cheated on her. Maybe you think, I don't care if I have his approval or not. But you do. Absalom did. And what we have now is a false repentance in verse 33. So Joab came to the king and told him, and when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king. And he bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. Joab talks to David. It's been two years you haven't seen your son. David sends for Absalom, but the reception he received was not the warm reception of a father, not at all like the prodigal son coming home. It was the cold reception of a monarch on a throne. If the repentance is not genuine. The rebellion will surface at a later time with even a greater degree of bitterness, greater anger, greater hatred. When a man is a father, his children must see him first and foremost as a father. Uh, children don't mind if a dad is something else a dad can he could be a businessman he could be a computer programmer he could be a pastor he could be a construction worker he can be a a, a tradesman that's okay as long as he is also a dad first and foremost absalom was treated like a subject when he should have been treated like a son and in 2 Samuel chapter 15, we're going to see Absalom, his rebellion grow, boil over. 
he'll devise a plan to take his father's throne. And before that chapter will end, David will be running for his life from Absalom the rebel because he has taken the throne of Israel. Please listen carefully. I'd like to make one of the most important statements you'll ever hear on the subject of family and one of the most important statements you'll ever hear that will ever come across our pulpit. Here it is. The key ingredient in raising godly children is to get and keep your children's hearts. Get their heart early. Keep their heart. Be extremely vigilant not to lose their heart. And if you've lost the heart of your kids, even your grown kids, we're going to look at some things that you can do to restore those broken relationships. Satan wants to de divide marriages. Satan wants to destroy families. Satan wants to separate you from blood relatives. God wants to reconcile. God wants to bring unity and unite your family. You may never get the love of your earthly father, but there is another father, your heavenly father, who offers his love to you. Never refuse his love. Receive his love. And you're going to have to make some tough decisions. What hill are you willing to stand on and die for and lose your family relationship? You discover real quick what's a conviction, what's a standard, and what's a preference. Your kids don't have to do it exactly the way you do it. Your grandkids don't have to do it exactly the way you do it but you still love them because they're, ki you're, they're your kids and your grandkids. Now, there's going to become a, a time where you draw a line in the sand and you say, this is where God stands and I stand with God. And Jesus said that time may come where, where, where the gospel separates you and a family member. But let's make sure it's the gospel, it's the truth, and not some petty preference, petty opinion. Pride separates families. So what's going to be the solution? Humility. God resisteth the proud but gives grace unto the humble. And so as we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, as we pray, God can do the miraculous and restore family relationships. Let's learn from David. Let's learn from Absalom. Let's learn what not to do. Let's follow the counsel of Malachi. God wants to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the children to the fathers. We need to walk in God's ways. May we pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word and the practicality that we find as we read and study and understand the principles of the word of God regarding family and relationships. Lord, help us. Help us to speak the truth in love. And may it be with a capital L. When there's a disagreement, may it always be done in such a way that we show love, we show concern, we show care. We go the extra mile to pour contempt on our pride our selfishness. Lord, help us now to reach out to family, immediate family, extended family. Lord, I pray that even through the holidays of Thanksgiving and Christmas, if there are broken relationships, though we can't control the other person, we have complete control over our words and our attitude. So God, tonight, take away the pride. Replace it with humility. Help us, as we saw this morning, to 
take the steps to have a clear and a clean and a healthy conscience before you and before others, especially in our families. So God, may the Word of God and the Spirit of God prompt us how to be able to navigate some very difficult family relationships. Lead us. Guide us. Give us your wisdom. And may we see your power displayed as we see you work in mighty ways. Lord, again for our country, how we pray that the division of pride and race relations, that the gospel will overcome and people will come together and learn to disagree without hatred, without violence. Help us to be light in the darkness. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.